until um, next week when I get back to campus. I'll be coming to campus starting on Monday. Um, so I will, we have a, there's a bunch of really fun demos and labs I want to do with that. So I can do covalent bonding really easily from here. And that's what I'm going to do this week. Probably get started on uh, metallic bonding Friday, but I'm not positive. So what does that mean? That means we were in seven, we went to nine, we went back to seven, and now we're going to eight. Okay, and we'll be here for a little bit, just a couple of sections probably, because there's quite a bit of information um, that I need to share with you. And then we'll go um, and finish up metallic bonding. Um, the homework tonight's out of the book. I went ahead and did a PDF of the question page, so you don't have to hunt for your book, or if you're at school and have extra time, you can do it still at school with your Chromebook. One other thing I want to mention, and I'll explain why <coughs> um, when I get into the lecture, but um, this is a little overview of carbon monoxide poisoning. And this is Consumer Reports review of the best carbon monoxide detectors. So um, I wanted to share that with you. I looked that, these up and posted them after first and second period. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll explain why that's a big deal later. But that's information for you. You can share with your parents or your guardians. All right, also in your class week, class work week eight feed, there is a uh, note sheet that we'll be using for the next couple of days. We won't get all the way through this today by any stretch, so don't panic. Um, and then I just, I made a Google Doc for the homework. You can just do it by hand and upload a picture to this. That would be fine. You have to use this, it's just there if you want. Okay, so uh, any questions before we get rolling? Anything for the good of the order? All right. Let's talk in. Everybody's good. So let's go ahead and start talking about covalent compounds. There's uh, several covalent compounds, quite a few, <laughs> that you actually already know, and um, they are different from ionic compounds. One of them that you've probably heard of is ozone. And ozone is a molecule of oxygen, but it's not oxygen gas that you breathe. So ozone is a three atom molecule, whereas oxygen that you breathe only has two. Okay, and this is three. And so uh, some of you might have heard of the ozone hole. We're gonna talk about that in detail, we probably have a video on Wednesday, which is going to be a day synchronous. But the hole in the ozone layer is a big deal because ozone is so important for blocking ultraviolet radiation. And um, if it's not there, then more UV rays get to the surface and more skin cancer. So um, yeah, we'll come back to that. All right, uh, for weeks now, we've been talking about ionic compounds. And table salt, of course, you know, is sodium chloride, properly named. It has the positive sodium cation and the negative chloride anion. Remember, sodium has one valence electron. Chlorine steals it, or sodium gives it away, however you want to think of it. Um, and <clears throat> you end up with a positive bit and a negative bit, and they're attracted to each other. And that is ionic compounds, and you know that a metal and a non-metal, okay? Well, it turns out lots of things form molecular or covalent compounds uh, when their atoms are shared together, okay? So ionic compounds are kind of the bad boys and girls in kindergarten. They steal things from each other. <clears throat> and covalent compounds are the good little kindergartners who they share with each other, okay? And we're going to come back to that. But obviously, the probably the most important one, <laughs> um, water, and then, of course, oxygen gas is another pretty important one for staying alive, too. But molecular compounds are all around you. 
Um, the reason why I brought up about carbon monoxide is because uh, it's in this PowerPoint, but it's also a current uh, news topic. Um, so you know you need oxygen to breathe, you know you breathe out CO2, you know plants absorb CO2 and photosynthesize it back into oxygen. Um, you hopefully know that when fossil fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is a byproduct that's in the atmosphere causes climate change. Um, whether it's coming out of your gas, uh, your car tailpipe, a <coughs> natural gas uh, electric plant, or coal fired burning electric plant, it doesn't matter. Anything that's using fossil fuels is going to be spewing CO2 into the atmosphere. The problem is. We also get carbon monoxide. So you know this is carbon dioxide because it has two oxygen. Carbon monoxide is just a carbon and an oxygen atom stuck together. Um, this molecule, unfortunately, will, um, if it's in the air you're breathing, will bind and uh, really well to the hemoglobin molecules in your red blood cells and won't release. Um, very easily. It takes a long time to clear carbon monoxide. Um, and unfortunately, in the last week or so, there's been uh, at least a half a dozen. I'm sure there's actually more that I don't know of, but that I've heard of uh, people dying from carbon monoxide poisoning in Texas because of the horrible cold snap that they got, the icicles in their, inside their houses, busted water pipes, no heat, no power. So what do they do? They bring in the barbecue. They bring in a camp stove and they run it inside their houses and um, anytime there's incomplete combustion, which is always, there's never perfect combustion, um, carbon monoxide also gets generated. And I know of a picture as a mom and a daughter car in the garage trying to stay warm with the car running and they both died and there's been others as well. So whether it's your car, whether it's a generator, other people have brought generators into their houses to try and you know power up their appliances and that will also get you some carbon monoxide poisoning. So please don't do that. Also um, if you uh, have a gas wall furnace like we do or a gas water heater or a gas stove oven uh, at your house you should really have a carbon monoxide detector well i think probably all of us have smoke detectors but not everybody has carbon monoxide detectors and they're a little bit more expensive than smoke detectors but they will save your life carbon monoxide is colorless odorless tasteless you have no idea it's there um, the only reason you know that the gas the propane coming out of your <clears throat> stove is that you know you guys have all smelled that that's an added uh, odor that's an added molecule added to the gas so you know if there's a leak carbon monoxide you won't know okay and um, it's particularly hazardous uh, for people who are sleeping which most of us do so uh, one of these little gizmos is well worth the 20 bucks um, <clears throat> they are a limited life. They don't last forever. There's a battery inside that causes them to uh, uh, go off. So uh, when you buy them, you can buy them for five years, ten years. Um, just know that you have to replace them because they'll start beeping <laughs> like your smoke detector does when the battery's low and uh, the backup battery's low. And uh, we had that problem. We thought it was our smoke detectors. We forgot about the carbon monoxide detector. I didn't know. I didn't know that they ran out. It didn't make any sense. Lesson learned. So I want to share that with you because it could save your life. That would be good. So why are we bringing up these two? Because they are molecular compounds. They are compounds held together by covalent bonds. And those covalent bonds involve two or more non-metals and you should all be going what the heck sketches you told us it had to be a positive metal with a negative non-metal how can two negative things go together they're not negative okay so now that you just finally got it figured out probably with how to figure out the charges 
I'm going to tell you there's another process that goes on that doesn't involve the exchange of electrons. It involves sharing electrons. And so, yeah, it's a different situation. <coughs> so it has a different name. Okay, so again, ionic compounds like sodium chloride are a metal with a non-metal, as I've already said, a cation with an anion. Not so here, which is also why they don't conduct electricity, right? Remember? So again, <clears throat> molecular compounds, so some people call them covalent compounds, some people, mostly it's called, they're called molecular compounds, but they're the ones with covalent bonds. They have low melting points. Now, it still might be uncomfortable for your flesh, <laughs> but it's still way lower than ionic compounds. Remember, ionic compounds have melting points of 1,000 or more degrees Celsius, a lot of them, and even higher, of course, for boiling points. Molecular compounds tend to have low melting and boiling points. Again, not every single one of them. And there are actually some that don't melt at all, they decompose, we'll talk about. Okay, um, because of those low melting points, there's a lot of them that are gases at room temperature, like carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, okay? Or there's also some of them that are very soft solids at room temperature. Now, paraffin is um, a hydrocarbon, which is the same thing as gasoline or propane, same class of compounds. Um, but it's a solid at room temperature, and that's because it's a really big molecule, 50 or more carbons together with all the respective hydrogens, and we'll learn about that in the coming weeks. But super soft. I couldn't scratch a piece of salt like that and get it under my fingernail. You know, wax is really, really soft, okay? So um, very different from ionic compounds. <clears throat> Usually, things like wax, oil... Um, they're not soluble in water. Of course, there's a big exceptions, again, with sugars. But not all sugars are soluble in water, just certain ones. Important ones that we like. <laughs> just like not all of them are sweet. Okay? And again, like we saw with the <clears throat> light bulb conductivity tester, um, they don't conduct electricity when they're dissolved in water, if they dissolve in water, or when they're dry, and that's because there's no charged particles to complete the circuit. Remember, sodium chloride splits apart into positive and negative bits that can complete the circuit, or other ionic compounds. <laughs> All right, so that's the introduction to covalent molecular compounds. Let's just talk about the term molecule in general. Um, first of all, we're going to start out talking about some of the elements. The only elements that are truly monatomic, right, that means one atom, are the noble gases. So our friends in group 18 or AA are monatomic. They exist completely as individual atoms. So helium and these balloons, the neon and this neon sign, they're only um, atoms. Now, um, metals are kind of monatomic. They share electrons, however, which is why they conduct heat and electricity, as we'll find out next week. <laughs> there are some elements that exist in their pure state as molecules. So what the heck's a molecule? Remember, a molecule is two or more atoms stuck together. They don't have to be different. They can be the same kind of atom. Okay? Now, a compound has different kinds of atoms, different elements stuck together. Okay? But molecules of elements exist, and there are seven that you have to know. Okay. There are seven elements that are what we call diatomic, and hopefully you know die for two. And they are the same element, and they stick together, and I'll explain why in terms of covalent bonding. So um, the main ones are the halogens, but we also have hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen lives on the wrong side, if you will, of the periodic table. It's truly a non-metal. 
jump the void and we've got nitrogen and oxygen, the two gases that make up the most of our atmosphere. And then the halogens going straight down, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are the diatomic elements. They exist in their pure elemental state with a buddy. Okay, they hang out together. So if I want to make water, I have to break that molecule apart and I have to break the hydrogens. Actually, I have to break two hydrogens apart. Otherwise, we'll have leftover oxygen. Okay, so a little bit of energy has to go in to split these, and a whole bunch of energy comes out when they get back together. If you remember from the Hoffman apparatus. I want to make water from oxygen and hydrogen with the lid split. So, um, again, it shouldn't happen, right? A negative three shouldn't go with a negative three, a negative two shouldn't go with a negative two, et cetera. But they're not taking electrons from anybody. Okay? They're not taking electrons from metals. They're just sharing electrons with their buddy. So, when, uh, here's a definition for you, single covalent bond. That's what happens when one pair of electrons is shared between two atoms. <coughs> that sharing happens in um, atoms that have missing electrons in their octet, okay? So most elements do, right? But with hydrogen, um, you know it is on the first line, it's in the S block, it's in First column, one S1, it has one proton and one electron, right? So this electron and this electron are unpaired, and it turns out electrons do better when they're paired. And so those electrons, and this is how we do the dot diagrams, right, for everybody in group one, those electrons will be attracted to the other hydrogen's nucleus. Okay, the negative electrons attracted to both, and when their clouds overlap enough, they will form a single covalent bond between them. So this diagram looks like they are overlapping clouds. Right? Same kind of thing happens with the halogens. We'll save nitrogen and oxygen for later because they're kind of complicated, but we'll just visualize hydrogen and then visualize this process for halogens. Remember when we do dot diagrams, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Advanced electrons, right? Group seven, 17. <clears throat> they have one, seven, A, 17. They have one unpaired electron that needs a buddy. Um, when you write it all out, their one of their p orbitals is half full. So if a second high, uh, excuse me, fluorine comes along, and their clouds can overlap, they can share the pair of electrons in between the two positive nuclei. So this would be how you would draw that all out. Again, there's a benefit to this, and we'll talk more about it <clears throat> tomorrow, but by sharing ooh, a pair of electrons, part of the time this electron is hanging out next to the fluorine on the left. Part of the time this electron is hanging out by the fluorine on the right with its own. And so... Those electrons kind of go back and forth between the two positive nuclei because they're kind of trapped there. And it's like a little tug of war, an even tug of war, because they have equal size nuclei. All right, some profoundness here. Dot structures have dots. But, uh, so there's different ways we can represent molecules. One way is with electron dot structures. This is the electron dot structure for hydrogen, diatomic hydrogen. And you can imagine, I hope, if we got going with all those halogens, and you'll see soon enough, actually. <laughs> oh my gosh, dot diagrams. 
get really tedious drawing all those electrons. So scientists, of course, like to do things shorthand. And so they came up with something called a structural formula that uses dashes for the bonds. So instead of writing dots, you just stick a line between the atoms that are bonded. And then you're supposed to be smart enough to figure out how many other dots there should be if you were doing this. But, you know, just like a straight line, right? There's two dots, makes a line. Okay. So think of it that way. Now, obviously it gets a lot more complicated. We're working with pretty small molecules, but that's fine. We're learning. Ammonia is NH3. That's the molecular or chemical formula of ammonia. I've shown you this before, but we're going to go through it again. Nitrogen, remember, has five valence electrons. It's in group 5A or 15. Hydrogen, on the other hand, has just one, of course, as you know. And so the hydrogen atoms can share an electron with nitrogen and when that happens each element gets I'll try to highlight it what the heck each element let's see if it works yay gets their full they're like a noble gas that did not work all right let's try again <coughs> So hydrogen gets two electrons part of the time, like its closest noble gas helium. And nitrogen gets five of its own plus three, one from each of these hydrogens. So it gets an octet part of the time. Remember, these electrons are going back and forth. Um, also, remember, this thing up here is called a lone pair. We're going to come back to that in just a second. If we did the structural formulas, it would look like the molecule is a T shape. It is not. Okay? But this connects, shows that nitrogen is bonded to hydrogen, nitrogen is bonded to this hydrogen, nitrogen is bonded. It doesn't even show the lone pairs here. And that's a that's a problem. This lone pair thing creates extra negativity and causes deflection of the hydrogen. So in some uh, college textbooks, they'll use this thing called a perspective drawing. Um, those of you that are artists know how to make something look far away by changing the length of the lines and stuff. Um, it's the same kind of thing here. This is trying to make it look like this is coming at you and this is going out and back a little bit. Um, if it works for your brain, great. I'm not super good at three-dimensional visualizations like this, but um, you will see this in a lot of books. So it kind of looks like a little tripod. When we get to building models, molecular models, we have some little uh, chemistry tinker toys, <laughs> little wooden spheres that have holes drilled in them. And they're different colors to represent different elements. And they have different numbers of unpaired electrons, real holes, um, that you can put dowel pieces into and build them. So this is a more correct shape, but you wouldn't have this big line thing. In reality, the hydrogens are smushed up next to the nitrogen, and this is called a space filling model. So they, the clouds overlap, and those hydrogen electrons are trying to get are getting pulled by the nitrogen. Yes. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to draw the same thing. Okay. So I can write it on paper. I can do dots. I can do lines. <coughs> I can try to give you some perspective on actual shape, but we'll be spending more time talking about shapes in a couple weeks. Almost done. All right, so um, probably you remember from biology that the shape of proteins, for example, is very important to its function. Okay? If it's not the right shape, it can't do what it needs to do. If a molecule isn't the right shape in the membrane, the other molecule can't get in. 
um, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, you probably remember doing DNA. Did you guys get to DNA models? I, nobody has spoken up. Did you guys get to that in Mrs. Olson's class? Yes. Yeah, yeah we did. Good. So um, you know all about your, your uh, nucleic acid bases and how it's a double helix and all the connections and stuff. And of course, the two gentlemen that got the credit for that were Watson and Kirk um, for supposedly discovering uh, <clears throat> the structure of DNA. But um, I'm going to play a little video about Rosalind Franklin here. So again, knowing the shape is really important to understanding how the molecule is going to work. For example, how it's going to replicate the unzipping and reforming of the bonds. Okay. And um, knowing the shape of molecules for our purposes, we're not going to get anything this big, <laughs> um, is also important how it um, behaves as well. And I'm going to stop that there. And I'm to play a real quick. Hank Green video on Where'd you go? When there are scientific discoveries, everybody wins, but also sometimes there are a few losers. But few scientists have lost out more famously than the woman who helped discover the structure of DNA, Rosalind Franklin. For that discovery, almost everybody knew the names of the men who got most of the credit, James Watson and Francis Crick. And what people did know about Franklin's contributions, they knew mostly from Watson's 1968 book, The Double Helix. In it, Watson describes Franklin as belligerent, emotional, and unable to interpret her own data. Forget for a moment the unpleasantness of insulting a woman who had been dead for 10 years at the time of the publication of Watson's book, or that he repeatedly refers to her as Rosie, a name she never used. The fact is, had she been alive in 1962 when Watson Crick and Maurice Wilkins were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery, many believe that Franklin would have, or at least should have, shared the stage with them. Born in 1920 in London to wealthy parents who stressed the value of education, Franklin studied physics and chemistry at Cambridge University. She earned her PhD with a thesis on the porosity of coal before moving to France in 1946. There, she became an expert in X-ray crystallography, a skill that would prove invaluable when she returned to England in 1951 for a job at King's College. Her arrival there coincided with a race among scientists at labs on two continents to be the first to deduce the structure of DNA. Franklin and Wilkins worked at the same lab, leading separate research groups, but their work inevitably overlapped as they worked the DNA puzzle. Many scientists then believed DNA had a helical structure like a corkscrew, but it hadn't been confirmed, and there was disagreement over whether it was a single or double or triple helix. Using X-ray diffraction techniques on crystallized fibers of DNA that involved exposures lasting hundreds of hours, Franklin was able to separate patterns that had baffled other researchers. In early 1952, one particular pattern that she would label as photograph 51 clearly showed two black stripes, the first real evidence of a helix with multiple chains. The now famous X-ray portrait not only confirmed the double helical shape, but also hinted at its manner of replication. Franklin continued her analysis unaware that at nearby Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, Watson and Crick were working on their own models, but still unable to confirm the helical structure. Though Franklin had yet to publish her images, Watson got a peek thanks to Wilkins, who shared the photograph with his rival in early 1953 without the knowledge or permission of Franklin. Watson wrote of the photo, the instant that I saw the picture, my mouth fell open and my pulse began to race. Less than two months later, using their own data, Watson and Crick announced to the world that they had discovered the structure of the double helix. Franklin's analysis and images would be published in the same 1953 issue of Nature, in which Watson and Crick announced their findings, but by that point, was a postscript. Franklin left King's College in 1953 to continue her work at Burbeck College in London. While traveling in the U.S. on business in 1956, she discovered a lump on her abdomen that turned out to be ovarian cancer. She died less than two years later at the age of 37. Tragically, her pioneering work with x-rays may have led to her early death. Like many scientists of her time, she rarely took precautions to protect herself from radiation. Over hundreds of hours spent taking images. No matter what anyone said or wrote about her, the world deserved more than 37 years of Rosalind Franklin. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow. The untold stories most of the time of people, it's not always the people that get all the glory.
that contribute. So I wanted to share that with you, leave it there. Your homework shouldn't take you too very long.